All right. So if we're going to read the Bible, you know what that means. If you don't, do what others are doing. <laughs> Say, Bob, I'm tired. Well, if the Lord were to walk in the room, I don't know that we'd be standing, probably be on our faces, but we can honor him by honoring this word. Genesis 1, beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and the every living thing that moves on the earth. And then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be for food for you. And every beast of the earth, and every bird of the sky, and everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw it all that he had made, so all of his creation up to this point, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Lord, I ask that you would take truths from this text and use them to build an understanding of our relationship with you, what your intention is in creating us. Lord, we have studied your creation of light and the luminaries in the sky and the sea. We have seen that you made plants and animals, Lord, and just an amazing thing. But no man was there to witness it. Not one single human being was there. But Lord, as we read now about the creation of the very species that we are, we recognize that you're going to teach us things about us now. We pray in Jesus' name you give us eyes to see and ears to her, a heart to receive what you're going to say to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, have a seat. Well, we finally come to the end of chapter 1. We're not exactly jetting through Genesis, I know, but that's okay. The Bible can stand your taking time with it because every word is inspired. And frankly, we missed all kinds of stuff along the way that you'll receive, I'm sure, in another study along the way. But tonight we're going to talk about God's masterpiece, the ultimate creation of God. And God has been going from uh, kind of progressing up to the climax of this particular uh, work on the sixth day, the creation of man. And so, uh, or at least the book of Genesis lays it out that way, and he inspired it. So put this down. God loves you, so he made you like him. Put in the word like. Verse 26, then God said, it's on day six, he's already created the animals, let us make man in our image. Put this down. You were created, and I was created to reflect God's nature. Now, immediately in reading the text, you, your eyes are riveted on this fact that there's God speaking, and yet he says, let us make man in our image. And of course, the question comes up, who's talking here? Who's talking to who? There have been all kinds of answers uh, about who that is, and I can tell you those answers that come from Judaism and rabbis never deal with anything from the New Testament in terms of the nature of God. Uh, there's things like the royal we, you know, I'm just myself, but I represent the kingdom, so a king would say, we have decided this. It's like we, where, you know. You and who else? Just all of me and my kingdom kind of thing. So this, this is a, a, a use within literature at times. And so some have suggested that God is speaking about himself or some have said, oh, he's talking about him and the angels. The only problem with that is man isn't created in the image of the angels and the angels have nothing to do with creation according to the text or anywhere else. So that one kind of falls flat. Really just about every other answer is a problem in terms of who God is talking to when he says, let us make man in our image. Now, we do know that God is one. God is one. By the way, this is one of the most important basic truths within Judaism. And that is taught in Deuteronomy 6. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. It's called the Shema or Shema. Behold, listen up, Israel. Jehovah is one God. And unlike all the ancient religions of the world that believed in polytheism, by the way, atheism was unknown in the ancient world. Did you know that? There were not atheists running around. That's a modern invention. By the way, did you know Christians were accused of being atheists and were arrested? You say, well, why would Christians be accused of being atheists? Because they only had one God. It wasn't enough. There's thousands out there they should be worshiping, and they had denied the gods. But anyway, in the ancient world, there were many uh, gods and the belief in many gods, uh, pantheism, and polytheism, etc. But God revealed himself to Israel and uh, to Moses, really, as the singular God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And so as you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, come to understand the New Testament, that it teaches us the Godhead is made of three persons, that seems to some to be polytheism or seems to be a contradiction to the truth that is clearly taught in the Bible that God is one. By the way, it is interesting there in Deuteronomy 6, the word that is used concerning uh, God being one, the word one is the word echad, which there's different words for one in Hebrew, and it means a unit, a unity. It, it is not a word that means the, the numeral one, he is one thing, but he is unified, is what it actually says. And so it's an interesting thing that God is saying this, and exactly what it means people will debate, but we should at least recognize this. The word God in Hebrew in the singular is El. You're probably very familiar with that. What you may not know is that in Hebrew, there is both singular and plural, but there's also something known as dual, which we don't really have in the English language, as best of my knowledge. A word can be written in the dual form. For instance, the word Jerusalem is Yerushalayim, and Shalayim, that ending, speaks of the dual. Jerusalem has as part of its name that it is two-natured. You say, well, why would Jerusalem have that be part of it? Well, probably because there is a earthly Jerusalem and there is a heavenly Jerusalem. There are two of them, you see. It's very clear in Scripture. But in any case, God is not here in the dual, which would be two, but He's in the plural, which means more than two. It's Elohim, and that word is then a word that speaks of God having a, a nature of at least three aspects. Now, I, I love that God is speaking to himself because it's not the only place this happens in the book of Genesis. It happens three times, by the way, in the Old Testament. Once also in Isaiah 6. Remember when Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up in the temple and the uh, angels are crying, holy, 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 and, and Isaiah confesses his sin. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell amongst a people of unclean lips, and the angel, the seraphim, touches his lips and, and, and cauterizes, burns his lips, and he's, he's healed and forgiven. And then God says, who shall go for us? Who? Us? And whom shall we send? And we have God again speaking in the plural, Tower of Babel, let us go down <laughs> and see if these things are so. And it's very interesting to me that we find it uh, a number of times in the Old Testament. Now, um, I, somebody shared this the other day. I loved it. You know, trying to imit, illustrate God, by the way, is always going to fail in some way or another. And the reason it is is it should. Trying to illustrate the nature of God will always fail. Why? Because God is transcendent. Um, he, 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 his nature is beyond our nature. Not only are His ways beyond our ways and His thoughts beyond our ways, but Isaiah 40, God says to what then will you liken me, saith the Lord? In other words, there's nothing out there. There's not only not another God, there's nothing that's a similitude. So when people say, well, God is kind of like an egg. You know, there's the yolk, there's the white, and there's the shell. There you go. God's the egg. Yeah, but no. <laughs> that's a, or he's like water. You know, water can, can, it can be a liquid, it can be a gas, it can be a solid. So, yeah, no. Um, there really isn't a perfect illustration of who God is, and we shouldn't expect to find one. He is unique, and so we have to allow Him to be so. However, I suppose the, one of the best illustrations of the nature of God is the triangle. We have a picture of, of something on there, and somebody has put together a triangle. 
where there is the Father, who is not the Holy Spirit, who is not the Son, who is not the Father, they are distinguished as separate persons in the Bible repeatedly. Even in the book of Genesis, we saw the Spirit hovering on the waters from the very beginning. The Spirit of God is there. But the triangle, which is one thing, if you will, there's one God who consists in three persons. And that's why we call it the Trinity or the triunity of God. God. And of course, man is made in the image of God. Now, people have debated and will continue. What exactly is the image of God in man? And at least we need to start by saying, well, God, what a privilege, because you didn't create anything else. You know, it's like man and the guppy or something. You know, nope, just you and me on this whole planet, out of everything God's ever created, bears the image of God. Even angels are not created in the image of God. And so it's a pretty high privilege. Um, man has body, soul, and spirit. He has three aspects to him. We know that. But we aren't three persons, and so we can't push that too far. Uh, how many of you have been to um, the Alamo in Texas? Okay. Remember the Alamo. You may or may not have seen this, but this is a fascinating. Uh, let's put that other slide up, guys. This is one of the first pictures that you see on the tour. That's not a very big museum there if you've been there, but it's there. Um, James Butler Bonham, that's the picture of James Butler Bonham. No picture of him exists. I'm sorry, that's not him. <laughs> that's not him. James Butler Bonham, no picture of him exists. This portrait of his nephew, Major James Bonham, who's died, he greatly resembled his uncle. So it's placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. It's like, we don't have a picture of him, so here's a guy that kind of, well, he, he's family, and he's got that, you know, same kind of chin or whatever. And I, I love this because we are obviously not God. I mean, if I take a photo of, of Steve right now and show you the picture, you go, oh, that's Steve. Well, that's not Steve. That's a picture of Steve. Can you imagine if that was really Steve? Hey, Steve. Can't talk anymore. No, it's not Steve. That's an image of Steve, right? Woke Steve up anyway. I'll work on some of the rest of you. Anyway, <laughs> my, my point is this. The image in, in our case it is not actually God. We're not God. We're not little gods. But there's aspects of how God, obviously God's not, a, the Father's not a body. He's spirit. We have a spirit, but we're not only spirit. Um, so the image of God is distinct from simply being a, we are little gods, no, but we have aspects of who we are in the creation that are like God enough that we bear his image, his resemblance in some ways that God initially created. Now, put this down, one of the truths that flows right in conjunction with him creating us in his image, realize you were created to reign. You were created to reign. And uh, look at verse uh, 26 again. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them, mankind, rule. That's the first thing he says over the fish and the birds, the cattle, and over insects, creeping things that creep <clears throat> on the earth. Um, jot down Psalm 8, verses 3 through 8, where David is going to focus on this truth. He says this, when I consider, he's talking to God, your heavens, the sky, the outer space, the work of your fingers, which is the moon, and the stars, which you have ordained. When I look at all of the starry host and the, and the planets, what is man that you have thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? In other words, I'm so small compared to these, these things you've created that are so glorious, you know. Yet you have made man a little lower than God, and you crowned him with glory and majesty. Notice now you make him what? Sounds like David read Genesis. <laughs> you make him rule over the works of your hands. And so, oh, it goes on. I'm not always sure where I, where I stopped. You have put all things under man's feet, all sheep and oxen, beasts of the field, the birds of the air, fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. So David is focusing on this text, really, when he's talking about the dignity and the glory that man has. Now, it's important that you realize you were created to rule. Now, I hope, that makes you, I hope you like that idea, 
But don't go too far with it right now. <laughs> because while we are to lead in a different capacity, lead people to Christ, lead people that are younger than us, lead their families, this is talking about something much more significant than that. You see, as believers, we don't behave in order to go to heaven. I would say there are a lot of people who are trying to do that. That will never work. The Bible will never, no one's getting into heaven because they obeyed. We do not behave because we want to go to heaven. We behave because our names are already written in heaven. Jot down Revelation 5.10. Here's what it says God has done. God has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. God says, I'm going to make man in my image, and first thing it says is he's going to rule over everything, and mentioned there in Revelation 1, that is exactly what our future uh, has for us. Um, there was a, a family who had a, a portrait of uh, George Washington. It was hanging in their home, um, and his guy's name was Oliver uh, Chandler of Genes... I don't know how to pronounce it, Geneseo, New York. Anyway, he had this portrait of George Washington that, that was hanging up in his house, but they couldn't figure out um, why it was never, ever, like, um, dusted. It had been there for years and years and years. Here's what it said. The family had always supposed the portrait was a common copy. Appraisers declared it, however, an original, a Gilbert Stewart portrait worth around $300,000. It eventually sold at auction for $925,000. And the writer says this, we treat those things of great value with more care than those things we consider common. And then it makes the application. Can we remember that every person is an original that God has made with great worth in the Lord's eyes? The concept of, the, of every person being created in the image of God, I don't care what they're wearing, I don't care uh, how they smell, I don't care anything about any of that. They're created in the image of God so much so in Genesis 9, verse 6, by the way, you don't need to turn there, the basis for capital punishment that God gave to Noah, the reason when a man sheds a man's blood, his blood must be shed, is tied to Genesis 1.26 because man was created in the image of God. And God says, that is an offense, that is an attack on me. Isn't that interesting? That's how important it is to God. And that's why God says when innocent blood is shed, whether it's a baby in the womb or uh, uh, somebody else, he, he, takes, he, he will take that and uh, make sure that justice comes as about. He demands justice for the blood of the innocent. Did you know that? Because of the, inno or because of the image of God. Now, put this down, number three. The image of God, as described here, is male and female. Verse 27 God created man in his own image, and again, now it's going to tie that to something. In the image of God, he created him, but don't just think that's Adam, because Adam really refers to Adam and Eve. I know that gets confusing. Adam, we think of Adam as, a, that was his name, but the word Adam means man in Hebrew. So when God made Adam, he made male and female mankind, is what he's talking about here. He created male and female and so when he's talking about creating man in the image of God, just put that down. The image of God is male and female. Now, angels, which, who we obviously are more powerful than us in the physical, are not created male and female. You may have seen female angels in pictures or paintings or cards, um, but the Bible does not in any way suggest there's gender associated with angels. Now, they can appear as men in Scripture. They do but that doesn't mean they're male. Angels are nowhere called male or female, nor do they propagate their kind. They don't make more angels. But man was given that responsibility, and so we have gender here, that his nature be propagated and his race continued. I like what Matthew Henry said about this concerning man compared to the angels. He said, fires and candles the luminaries this lower world has grow dim and go out. So they have power to light other lights. Not so with the lights of heaven. Stars don't kindle stars. In other words, stars don't produce stars. You know, stars are produced by nebula and clouds and gases. 
But it's very interesting. He's making this analogy that God has decided that we human beings who are compared to angels, we seem so fragile. We seem, you know, our lives aren't very long. But in reality, we're eternal beings. But God has given us capacities they don't have. Put this down uh, in terms of kind of a, uh, a conclusion or an application. Give yourself to God who marked you as His, as His own. Um, you don't have that one? Well, make it up. You can write it. Yeah. <laughs> then don't write it down. Just do it. <laughs> write that sentence down if you don't mind. Give yourself to God who marked you as His own. Now, here are some truths about being created in God's image. It, it raises our dignity. Every human being, as I said earlier, it, it tells us this. We are not the products of some galactic accident, nor are we the occupants of the top rung of an evolutionary ladder not according to the Bible. Because we're created in the image of God, that's unlike angels or animals in the Scriptures. We have a unique relationship to God. We have minds, we have emotions, and we have will. But listen, also, here's how I can distinguish us. We have an inner spiritual nature that enables us to know God and ennobles us to worship God, listen, uniquely as those who have been redeemed by God's grace. Angels do not have that. We are unique in that regard. And while the image of God in man has been marred, we'll get to that in Genesis 3, because of the fall of man, through faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches, through faith in Christ and really submission to the work of the Holy Spirit, that that image of God can be restored and is being restored in every person in this room who has a relationship with the Lord. I love that. Paradise lost, paradise restored. Now, give yourself to those, uh, give yourself to God who marked you as his. Do you remember when they came trying to test Jesus? That was kind of a silly thing to do, but I mean, they went for it. Sadducees tried, the Pharisees tried, they all had all kinds of little theological questions for Jesus, and usually they just walked away deciding not to talk to him anymore because he, he beat them pretty bad. One of the questions was, is it lawful to pay taxes? Remember that one? Now we know, and whether you like it or not, the Bible's really clear, we are commanded to pay taxes, every one of us. We don't like taxes, we want them to all go away. Every president that runs for office, every person that runs for office is no more taxes, right? <laughs> Watch my lips. Um, doesn't usually work out that way. Um, there are things going on right now that are gonna raise taxes. Yeah, no matter what somebody says. But the fact is, the Bible talks about this, that it's our responsibility as citizens to pay taxes, to pay t appropriate taxes. But when they asked Jesus the question, it was a trick question, because they knew that the people would hate him if he supported paying taxes uh, to the Romans. They were occupied, and paying taxes, they considered it offensive to do so, That kind of like, that's not honoring the Lord. So they, and if he, of course, said, no, don't pay taxes, then they could accuse him as being uh, of treason, which is ultimately what they, they did accuse him for before Pilate, by the way. But it's interesting to me, Jesus, he's so wise. So is it lawful to pay taxes? Do you remember what he said? Give me a, a coin, a denarius. And he simply asked a question. What was the question? Whose likeness, image, inscription, different translations, is on the coin. And they said, Caesar. And Jesus said, well, then give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. I mean, if his image is his, his, obviously, they minted it. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar. But that's not the important thing that he said. That's about taxes. It's the next thing he said. Don't miss it. And render, that's King James, give to God the things that are God's. Well, what has God's image you, you. Jesus was saying, this is irrelevant. Some guy minted some coins, give them back to him if that's what they want. But a far more important issue is that you give to God that which has the image of God stamped on it. And the only thing you own that has the image of God stamped on it is you. Don't you love it? The Lord's saying, give yourself back to the one who made you. Put this down, letter B. God calls us to reproduce and to rule, to reproduce and to, and to rule. Verse 28, God blessed 
them, Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, very similar to what he said to the, to the fish and to the fowl, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish and the birds and every living thing that moves on the earth. Put in the words reproduce and rule, unless I left that one out too, and then I don't know. But to put this down as a principle, do the math, we were made to multiply. We were made to multiply. Now, the Bible teaches there in Psalm 127, children are a heritage or a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. I love that. The fruit of the womb is His reward. Reward. Now, couples today, I get to be with our young married couples, so I, I hear the discussions that they're having. Um, most of them haven't started their family. A few of them have started their families, you know. Some are just getting pregnant, and, you know, couples shared that a couple weeks ago. We're excited for them. Um, but couples getting married today ask questions like this um, to, of each other. Do you want to have kids? Um, how many do you want to have? How soon do you want to start? Can I tell you something? All those questions, completely foreign to any ancient Jewish man and woman. They would have never asked any of those questions because those questions everybody knew. Do you want to have kids? Absolutely. How soon? As soon as possible. How many do you want to have? As many as possible. In fact, in, in the mind of the Jew, to not be willing to have children was considered a sin because they thought they were diminishing. Somebody that wouldn't have children were diminishing the image of God on the earth. Did you know that? That's the way they looked at it. Now, the Scripture doesn't say that. But that's, that was their attitude. Such a blessing to have children who in their right mind would not want them. And there are plenty of grandparents who ask that about their kids who aren't ready to have children yet. I, I know that. But remember in our text when God was creating that God created empty spaces so that he could fill them. We talked about that. God filled the empty space with the sun, the moon, and the stars. He filled the empty sky, the heavens, with the birds. He filled the empty sea with fish and the empty land with animals. And, and, and so now it's kind of like this. God's saying, you know that I have filled empty spaces. It's your turn. I've created you in my image. It's, you're going to do that. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Now, there might be somebody in this room who said, I never got married. Or I'm, I got married, but I'm unable to have kids. I will never have that blessing or have that fulfillment. L let me ask a question in Scripture. Let's talk about some men. Who are some men who never had children? Raise your hand if you can think of a man who never had a child. Yeah? Pete? In Scripture, in Scripture. Paul never had children that we know of anyway. Had a nephew, but yeah. Daniel, who else did not have children? Yeah. Simeon? Samson? John the Baptist, Jesus. Now, I wanted you to, you, we could probably go on from there. I wanted you guys to hear those names. Paul the Apostle never had physical children. Would anybody suggest he was unfulfilled because he didn't have children? Jesus never had children. Would anybody suggest he was not completely fulfilled by, in, 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 because he didn't have physical children? Jot down 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15. Listen to what Paul says to the church there. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your what? I became your father through the gospel. He calls Timothy his true son in the faith. Can I tell you something? Every single Christian can parent. Every single Christian can be used of God to fulfill this command spiritually, to be fruitful and multiply. And so if God has not called you to having physical children, don't think, oh, I've lost that blessing. Not so. Jesus said, except a grain of wheat fall to the earth and die, it remains alone. But if it die, it'll bear much fruit. And I think sometimes we look at the physical, we think, oh, that blessing, I didn't get that blessing. Listen, that blessing, that physical blessing, I'm not trying to minimize it, it's wonderful, but let me tell you something, it is a picture. 
it is an illustration in the physical of the greater spiritual blessing that's available to every person in this room, whether you believe it or not. God has designed you to be fruitful and multiply, if not physically, definitely spiritually. How do we multiply? Well, it's really clear. In Acts chapter 6, the Word of God, it says, increased, and the number of disciples multiplied when the Word was shared. That's how. The Word of God, as it comes into our life and through our life, then God's multiplication can happen as people come to know Christ. Put this down. God calls man to take charge over the beastly nature. Verse 28. He says, not only fill the earth, but subdue it. Now, this is interesting to me. It almost sounds like there's a war going to go on. Subdue it. Well, there's no sin in the world yet, but the animals need subduing. You know, um, now James says every manner of animal has been tamed. What is the wildest, most exotic animal anybody in here has ever seen tamed? You ever seen something where you couldn't believe it, but there was one. It was a tame one of those. Anybody? Raise your hand so I know. A snake, like a you know where they played the. What is that thing? That that thing. I was gonna say a fife, but the the little well you know, in India. Okay. Python. What else? Oddest animal? Yeah. A bear? So, okay. Maybe at the circus? Tiger? Yeah, you've got to be careful on those, huh? Especially if you're an illusionist in Las Vegas. Yes? A platypus. A tame platypus. You mean as in this was somebody's pet? Wow. So, so James says, every manner of animal has been tamed. In James' day, and it's been a couple thousand years since then, of taming animals. So there's no animal that, that can't be relatively tamed. He goes on to talk about the part of the body that can't be tamed, which is what? The tongue. <laughs> it's right inside your mouth. You can't control it. <laughs> he calls it a restless evil, full of poison, set on fire by hell itself. And no man can tame the tongue. But this idea of the, the taming of, of, really, the animals that God had created, it's interesting to me that God would have man have this challenge. You know, before, I think sometimes Christians think, you know, I can't wait to go to heaven because then I don't have to work anymore. Well, can I ask you, did, did Adam have a job before he sinned? What was his job? Naming the animals, tending the garden. You go, oh, no, I'll never get out of gardening the rest of my eternity. Listen, work is not evil. Because of sin, work is vanity. Much work is vanity, not all work. Your work is not in vo- your toil is not in vain in the Lord. <laughs> but thorns and thistles that shall yield for you. That's no gardener wants to hear that. It, it, it's going to be in sweat that you're going to eat. You're going to. It's going to be a lot harder than it needed to be. God added an element of of waste that comes with work. So you feel like, what's the point? I'm not getting anywhere. That's the result of sin. Work itself is noble. Six days thou shalt labor. By the way, it always amazes me. I was sharing with somebody about the Sabbath. They were asking me, you know, how come, uh, you know, Christians don't honor the Sabbath, which is, they said, Sunday. I'm thinking, well, let's start with the fact that it's never been Sunday, and it never will be Sunday. Biblically, it's not. The fact that Christians worshiped on Sunday had to do with the resurrection. It had nothing to do with the Sabbath. But besides that, it amazes me how many people want to do no work on Sunday or, the, or on Saturday even uh, who don't obey the command fully in the Ten Commandments, which says, six days you shall labor. So whenever somebody's telling me, why don't you rest on Saturday, I ask them, why don't you work the rest of the week? Because God, could, anyway, um, off target. Let's go back to where we were talking about. I'm not even sure what we're talking about, but I got into that. Okay, put this down. Oh, you already did. <laughs> Think about this. God tells man, I want you to rule over these three areas of the fish, the fowl, and the animals. You know, Jesus demonstrated that. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus demonstrated his authority over fish, didn't he? When he said, hey, throw the net on that side, Peter, right now. I know you fished all night, but watch this, right? Or go down and take your pole. I know we need to pay the tax, so go down. We'll take care of it handy to have Jesus around, isn't it? 
especially at tax time. I mean, it was pretty cool. Um, and how about when Peter denied the Lord? And what happened? What Jesus had said before the cock crow. He sensed his sovereignty, not just his foreknowledge, but his sovereign control. How about the beast? Did he not ride the donkey, the donkey that had never been ridden before into Jerusalem? Does Mark 1 not say that when he was out in the wilderness, he was also with the wild beasts? Yet Jesus demonstrated his own authority, his rule over these three spheres. But we are called humanly to be engaged in this challenge of what is part of God's creation. It's part of his desire that we would uh, take charge over that. But I also see in this an interesting thing. Man is not given sovereignty over the sun or the moon or the stars, but over living things in the animal kingdom. Now, this teaches us at least this. There are some things beyond our control, but there are some things within our God-given sphere of control. Do you remember what the Lord said to Cain? It says Cain became angry and upset. Let me ask you, why did Cain get upset? Why was Cain depressed? Raise your hand if you remember why he was upset. Who, who remembers? Over there, why was he upset? Because God did not accept his offering. Um, he accepted his brother's offering. I'm not sure if he would have been upset if it was just him, but it was that jealousy thing, you know. And so he became despondent and angry. It's very interesting when we, things don't go our way, we can get depressed and we can get angry. By the way, those two sins and those two emotions are very much tied to each other. I, I don't know if you've noticed uh, that, that uh, uh, pain, emotional or physical, can get tied to anger, right? Guy hits his thumb. What does he go? Oh, my thumb. Oh! Ah! He gets mad. Where does anger come from pain? Well, they're related. And so uh, Cain gets angry and depressed. And God comes to him. How gracious is that? Cain has sinned. That's why he's in the condition he's in. But God comes to him and says, Cain, why are you angry? Now, God already knows. It's not like a... can't figure this out. Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? You know what that means? Your, your, your face is droopy. You've got a sad face. Why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen? And then God even gives him the prescription of what to do to change it. I love it. He says, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. What? And its desire is for you, but you must master it. Very interesting. Sin, God says, is like a, uh, an animal that sees you as prey that can take you down if you're not careful and you don't deal with it. And he did not. We know Cain went down because of his sin. He chose to go out and kill his brother. Interesting. God's telling man, I want you to be over those animals that have that beastly nature. So sin is pictured as that animal that has to be subdued. And of course, we can't do that except by the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, but if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we'll live. The Spirit of God can give you the ability over your flesh. You don't have the ability. Who can tame the tongue? No man. But that doesn't mean no God. God can tame your tongue. Look at Acts 2. Spirit of God distributed himself as tongues of fire. You're, you can have your tongue set on fire by hell or heaven. Who's got your tongue? Remember, that's the big question. And so Paul says there in Corinthians, I buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest after having preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. In other words, I have a responsibility before the Lord. Yes, there's nothing good that dwells in my flesh. And if I allow it, that fleshly nature is like a beast, God says. But he's telling man, you've got to subdue that. I think it's a fascinating analogy. Anyway, put this down under C. God sustains and appraises all that he makes sustains and appraises. Verse 29, then God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And every vegan said, amen. <laughs> and if you just want to live in Genesis 1, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and everything that moves on the earth, which is life, I have given every green plant for food. 
and it was so. And God saw all that he had made. Now it's not just day six, but day one through six now. He's looking back. And behold, it was tov ma'ov in the Hebrew. It was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. We'll put this down. Since God made you, you need to trust he will meet your needs. So God makes man, but he also makes food for man, and it's ample. Would you jot down Psalm 36 and verse 6? God, your righteousness is like the mountains, or rather, your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like a great deep, O Lord. You preserve man and beast. Psalms talks much about this. God, you feed the animals. You provide for the animals, and you therefore will provide for me. Um, we have a bird feeder in our bag. How many of you have bird feeders? Yeah, okay. Um, I say we because my wife has one, so I can claim I have one. I don't ever fill it, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm not proud of that, actually. I'm not so, hey, I don't, bird. no, I mean, I do once in a while when she says, will you feed the birds? So I do it, but, um, you know, we buy bird food, and, and uh, she, almost every morning, will say, oh, I've got to go feed my birdies. And I'll say, God feeds the birds. <laughs> and she'll say, I know, he uses me. <laughs> So, yep, she's right. Can't, no argument there. You know, at least in my house. Um, God takes care of what he creates. Jot down Matthew 6 and verse 26. Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, nor do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet Jesus says, your heavenly Father feeds them. And then the conclusion that he's trying to get you, you know that already, are you not worth much more than they? If God feeds the birds that you don't even give a second's thought to, then why would you worry about the things you need? That clearly the idea is you really don't understand the nature of God when you worry about provision. You don't really trust Him. He made you. Yep, but now He's going to leave me to starve. No, He's not. He may not feed you the way you want to be fed, you know. Um, Jesus said, we're to pray, give us this day our daily bread. We might well give us this day our daily filet mignon. Well, you can pray that all you want, but the prayer that we're to pray like was a little simpler. My God shall supply all your needs. Not my God shall supply all your greeds. <laughs> that doesn't work that way. But God's going to take care of you. So the shepherd that becomes the sheep says, the Lord is my shepherd, and so I don't really need anything. I'm doing good. I, uh, I like this story. Let me read it to you. There was a Christian lady who lived next door to an atheist. Maybe you live next door to an atheist. Every day when the lady prayed, the atheist guy could hear her. He thought to himself, she's nuts, praying all the time like that. Doesn't she know there isn't a God? And many times while she was praying, he would go to her house and harass her, saying, Lady, why do you pray all the time? Don't you know there's no God? But she kept on praying. Now, one day she ran out of groceries, and as usual, she was praying to the Lord, explaining her situation, thanking him for what he was going to do. And as usual, the atheist heard her praying and thought to himself, oh, I'm going to fix her this time. He went to the grocery store, bought a whole bunch of groceries, took them to her house, dropped them off on the front porch, rang the doorbell, and then hid in the bushes to see what she would do. When she opened the door, she saw the groceries and began to praise the Lord with all of her heart, jumping and singing and shouting everywhere. The atheist jumped out of the bushes and told her, you old crazy lady, God didn't get those groceries for you. I bought those groceries. Then she broke out and started running down the street shouting and praising the Lord. When he finally caught her, he asked what her problem was. She said, I knew the Lord would provide me with some groceries, but I didn't know he was going to make the devil pay for them. <laughs> Oh, to realize that your need, my need, is an invitation to trust God. It's an opportunity for God to reveal to us again and again and again. You know, what did David say? I, I was young and now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous begging for bread or his seed uh, disregarded, neglected. Oh, it just hasn't happened, you know. The Lord takes care 
of his own. Put this, put this down. God gives us an example to review and to evaluate. And it's his own example. After each day, save the second, God reviews his work. Each day, he says, at the end of the day, it is good. It is good. Tov, tov, tov. It is good. He kind of like gives himself a self-report card. That was good, you know. Um, and then, of course, at the end of the the creation week, the end of God's work, he said, it's, it's very good. Isaac Watts penned a hymn called, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. And in that second verse, it says, I sing the goodness of the Lord who filled the earth with food, who formed the creatures through his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye, if I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. In other words, all around us we're seeing the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God that is to remind us that God is that way. But notice the Lord does this. At the end of every day, he looks back and he evaluates his work. That should teach us at the end of our day, getting ready for bed, whatever, later, should think back. How'd it go? That won't always be what God said. I know that. But we should look at it. We should review and evaluate it. At the end of a week, God's here at the end of a six days, now getting ready for the Sabbath rest. The work week is done. Take some time. Look back on the week. Evaluate it and assess it. And when you come to the end of your life, when your work is done on this earth, you want to be able to look back and evaluate it, and your prayers, Lord, I want to be able to say, it was very good, but you know, Lord, I don't trust my own judgment. Remember how Paul said, I don't know of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. For I do not judge myself, but I am judged by the Lord. And so, Lord, you're going to have to search me and try my heart. I, I can't, maybe go, I don't see any problem at all. Praise the Lord, but don't stop there. Say, God, you see it all. You try the hearts and the range. You try the innermost men. You know the truth that there's wickedness in me. If I'm not aware of it, Lord, I want to see it. I want to deal with it. But it's good for us to look back, review, and assess like the Lord does. And then ultimately, like God does at the end, you want to, you know, basically what he was done with his creation, it's kind of like he said to himself, well done. Does that sound familiar? That's what you and I want to hear. See, God is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. You are the workmanship of God, Ephesians 2.10. He made you fearfully and wonderfully in your creation, in your body. And now your life is God at work in you and through you. And at the end, you want to hear him say what he said at the end of the week, well done. But it's really about what he did in you and through you. So four things, and we're going to go back to worship, put these things down. Give yourself holy to God. Why? Because you're created in His image. Put in the word consecration. Do you have four fillings at the end? Yeah. Hallelujah. Put in the word consecration. This passage teaches us that we must dedicate ourselves to God because we're made in His image. Reproduce the life that God gave. Put in the word multiplication. And here we're talking about spiritually now. Every one of us can fulfill that. Reproduce the life that God gave you as a Christian. Multiplication. Thirdly, answer God's order to rule sanctification. Lord, I want to have victory over the peace that lies within, you know. Answer God's order to rule sanctification and finally live for God's final approval and that's glorification. That's the day when I'll stand before the Lord and he'll assess my life, he'll review my life and my prayer, he's, he, he can say, well done thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, get us ready now to sing praise, worship to you. Lord, would you open our hearts that it doesn't just come from our mind. Lord, it has been a long day. We need refreshing. And so I pray that your spirit would touch us. I pray that you would allow your word to kind of uh, simmer in our hearts and that you would give us application. Lord, if we have an area of our life that really isn't dedicated to you, it's, it's being run by us and we're making a mess of it. Help us to give that to you or back to you. Lord, if there's uh, some animal that is making us pray, and like Cain, we're, we're not listening to your word. Lord, we want to repent of that. We are wanting, Father, your word to change us right now. So as we sing and worship and exalt you, hear our worship. 
meet us in this place in Jesus' name. Amen.